Hello and welcome to Unleashed, the show that explores how to thrive as an independent professional. I'm your host, Will Bachman, and I'm here today with McKinsey alum Thomas Brewer, who has been around. And Thomas, welcome to the show. I think that you are going to start with a Marvin Bauer story. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure uh, to be a uh, guest in your podcast, Will, and be part of Ambrix. Uh, as a young uh, consultant, just uh, fresh from uh, graduating from the Harvard Business School at age 23, I joined McKinsey in New York. And to my great surprise, uh, Marvin Bauer did personally every Saturday morning training of all new associates and interestingly enough all not so new associates including some of the partners and through this kind of uh, training he basically imparted highlights so i'll share a few of them with you and then some amazing story many uh, years afterwards uh, on some uh, encounters uh, that I had uh, with Marvin. Uh, some of the highlights of what he said were always do the right thing, the ethical way, in the best interest of the McKinsey client, which is not necessarily the case uh, in today's business world and for so many people. Second, he said always look first at the big picture from the point of view of what is best for the company and the stockholders as if you were the CEO, but look always, not just at the short term, but at the long term. And he also said, always be fact-based and understand all the different forces that are at work. In those days, strategy and being a generalist was the key demand. Not like today, specialization, and international in those days was something rare. So those were some nuggets. Uh, then uh, when I left McKinsey after 10 years, because I wanted to be uh, a line executive in a um, healthcare company, yeah, I met uh, when I was VP of Asia and Latin America for Baxter. Uh, in O'Hare Airport, I met passing by somebody that said, well, I really know this person. Well, it was Marvin Bauer. Hmm. And as we passed each other, he said, Tom, how are you? How are you doing? Now, that was Marvin Bauer for you. Wow. He knew every person in some of their personal their life, and they were not just a number. Each one was a valued uh, asset of McKinsey, and he did his personal best to nurture it and do the best for each associate. So it was an incredible experience. I was 10 years with McKinsey, and that experience was worth 20, 30 years or somewhere else, in my humble opinion. Wow. Now, Marvin was basically involved. He was sort of the second uh, involved in really building McKinsey as a firm, obviously. Listeners know that. And I think he started in the 30s or something. So when he was leading these training sessions for associates, this was what, in the late 60s, early 70s? When, what's the timing? Of it? Yes, yes. I mean, so he had been with the firm for 30 years. So he was like basically the managing director of the entire firm. And he's coming in on Saturday morning to lead associate training. That is yeah. that's crazy. Tell us a little bit about the training. Would you go through case studies or, you know, was it role model, role, role playing exercises? What was the training like when you when you went through it? Well, he, he basically talked, uh, th there were some uh, uh, mini cases, but more he would give the background. Uh, he would never say what company, you know? He would say what industry, the type of uh, uh, assignment, and uh, the way to look at it, okay? Uh, in th that way, he, he, would, uh, he wouldn't get to, into the specifics, because they were confidential, but said, well... When somebody calls us and says, uh, it's this, the CEO that we want you to do for you, he will explain uh, how uh, he would handle that situation, how McKinsey, under his guidance, handled it. And so uh, through that, you learn these different lessons that, that I mentioned. Uh, 
And then, interestingly enough, it, it wasn't just new associates. This is the thing that surprised me more. At the, at the beginning, he just had uh, the new associates. But then um, he had sessions for everybody, several times, several Saturdays per month, where he had associates had been a long time and partners. This was amazing. Hmm. That's incredible. Yeah. So you... You know, before we start recording, you kind of walked me through your incredible career. You were at Baxter, and uh, just tell the story of of your first. Uh, you started there, I think, in strategy role, but then you got assigned to Mexico. Uh, tell, tell me that story of, about when your your first line role in Mexico. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> well, yes, uh, at the time I was uh, when I. Uh, uh, left McKinsey uh, after being 10 years there, first in uh, New York, uh, then in Paris uh, in their European practice, and then helped them to open up Latin America and Mexico. Uh, I joined Baxter as an as, assistant uh, uh, to the VP of International. And the deal was, uh, wherever in the world uh, an opening came up to be a general manager, the understanding was that you would accept it and go there and not cherry pick. So uh, God knows uh, what country would come up. Well, after uh, one year of being assistant uh, to the VP of International, the first one came up and it was Mexico. So he calls me into the office and says, Tom, I've got good and bad news for you. Which one do you want me to start with? I said, well, start with the good news. She said, well, the good news is, as of today, you are the new general manager for the three Baxter companies in Mexico. I said, well, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. So he says, now let me tell you the bad news. Uh, we are in deep trouble in these companies. So if you don't fix it within a year, I'm firing you. <laughs> uh. So what do you say, Tom? Well, at that point, you know, uh, married, English wife with two young, uh, very young children. I said, sure, I'll do it, Bill. As long as you support me in whatever I got to do there to fix the ship. He said, you've got my uh, promise to do so. So th th that's uh, how we started my career uh, at Baxter. Yes. What was it like? Uh, opening up Mexico and Latin America for McKinsey, um, I went to I went to, I did my last semester of business school in Mexico, and mm. you know in my experience it was a culture where it's um, really important kind of having personal connections with people. You know I, this was graduate school and from you know, the last semester of my MBA, and people would talk about like where they went to high school, right, uh, as opposed to even where they went to college. So it seemed to be you know, really important, you know, who you knew. What was it like coming in as an outsider? I mean, you did speak Spanish, obviously. I know you grew up in Uruguay. But uh, what was it like coming in as an outsider? How did you open up new clients there? Did you hire local, um, you know, Mexicans to join McKinsey? Or how did you build the, the practice? Yeah. No, this is, this is a very good question. Um, well, it the, 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 it was a, a team of uh, three people that, that opened it up, uh, an American, uh, a, an Austria a person, and myself. That was it. There was no staff whatsoever, not even to present, make a presentation, uh, nothing. Uh, so at the beginning, uh, I think... We just did it ourselves from the very beginning, okay? Uh, using some of the McKinsey contacts uh, in the sense that there were clients uh, the, that uh, had go good, uh, good clients and they were multinational and they needed help in Mexico. So we thought that uh, this is the way things would start. But that, that was not the way it worked. Um, it, basically... Uh, we did a lot of uh, l letting people know uh, by writing uh, articles and making f uh, certain phone calls uh, uh, that we existed and what McKinsey was good at. 
And uh, so at, at the beginning, we had uh, some very interesting clients, not the, the normal McKinsey client. Now, for example, one it was um, a supermarket. Um, this um, it was a very rich lady that uh, was a widow. She inherited this huge supermarket chain and uh, she didn't know what to do and she she inquired and heard that uh, McKinsey was very good in this uh, area and then uh, she contacted us. So that uh, was one of our first clients, which was unbelievable. Uh, Her house had uh, a swimming pool uh, in it and the sun, uh, it would revolve around uh, the sun okay so, so it was an unbelievable experience so that that was uh, one case and then uh, as we started getting more more uh, clients then we uh, also hired some uh, mexican associates and little by little uh, we built it but at the beginning we did our own presentations okay in uh, in those in those days even with uh, you know slides that's so it was an incredible experience, yes. And then, of course, the office grew a lot, and then, uh, you know, everybody benefited from that, yes. So you left McKinsey, you joined Baxter, you were with Baxter, I think, for about 20 years, and then in 2002, you started your own firm and uh, focused on medical device and life science industry. Tell us a bit about, about the firm that you run. Thank you for asking that. Yeah, a Brewer Partners um, and Company is totally focused on medical technology companies and life sciences uh, companies. And uh, to help them to improve significantly their sales and profits. Uh, and that's uh, basically what we do, but uh, internationally. So you, we have you have partners yeah. you have your members of your firm based where yeah uh, we have 14 partners and some are based in the u.s some are based in europe uh, some in latin america some in asia and some in the middle east and um, in africa so it's uh, it really is a global company and we have most of our clients are on the one hand u.s clients and for them everywhere outside of the U.S. is international, but we have a fair uh, amount of clients that are European, and for them, the U.S. is international, as is uh, other parts of the world, you know, Asia, Latin America. Uh, And we've also worked uh, not just for uh, the companies that manufacture, but also for uh, private equity uh, companies when they want to... uh, evaluate uh, companies that they are considering or whether they've made acquisitions and they want us to be part of their team and also mergers and acquisitions uh, p- uh, companies that specialize in that uh, ask for our help uh, in evaluating or doing uh, due diligence uh, both in the u.s and uh, abroad yeah walk us through a case study uh, of a, a sample project that your firm's done. Sure, glad to do so. Uh, we have two business models. Uh, one uh, is the normal fee uh, for a project uh, basis. So an example of that, and the other model is a success fee. And uh, if I can, and we have enough time, I'd like to give a, a case uh, of that uh, kind of uh, project. Yeah, definitely. If the one for fee, like a project, is, uh, for example, we had a major multinational medical device company in the orthopedic field. And they contacted us uh, saying that the president of that uh, key international region was very unhappy with the share of market that they had uh, in that important region. And uh, that there had to be a way uh, to do much, much better. And so I tried very hard to convince him that it should be a success fee project. Uh, But I was unfortunately not uh, successful in doing so. So it was a fee for project. And the reason I say it's unfortunate because uh, in our three year involvement with him in this project, 
their share of market uh, went up by a factor of five times. So uh, the, the project, uh, you know, it was, it was profitable with good partners, but uh, not as profitable as it could have been. And what, uh, what we did in that case was, uh, you know, the normal thing of uh, uh, analyzing uh, the key facts and the forces at work. In other words, for their own company, uh, what was the share of market in other regions, including the U.S., and why? And for their competition in the different regions, how well were they doing and why? And then what are the key factors for success and lessons learned from that? Well, then uh, we helped them to develop a new strategy, uh, focusing a few countries. And, uh, for example, they had, didn't have subsidiaries at that time. And then, basically, uh, and this was very important, to hire in those key countries an uh, employee of uh, our client to be the sales manager in that country working with the distributor. In that way, he could have much more control of what's going on and give much more advice. And more importantly, he would be part of the key relationships, be it with customers, government, or other entities. Uh, and this worked extremely well. Uh, and then we created uh, an action plan for each one of those countries. And this was not done as a, a, a solo. Uh, we, like McKinsey does, is with a client team. And I convinced the president of the division that it was very important to just have not just some warm bodies, but uh, people that were really good, including among them, whoever he thought right now might be the head of that division if things turn out well. Uh, that, that was a hard uh, choice for him because it was a valued uh, team member, but he did appoint him and he was with uh, some of his colleagues, part of the team. And as things started to work out, first, it was a good way to evaluate him, and he turned out to be very good. He then named him head of the division. So in, in the first, in the second and third year, our involvement was less. Uh, but uh, they continued the work, and after three years, they achieved that good result. So that, I thought, was uh, a very interesting uh, uh, experience. And not dissimilar to what uh, I did at uh, Hollister when I was director of international sales for 20 years before retiring in 2002 to form Brewer Partners, which is you focus with exclusive distributors in key countries, and then you develop the business with the objective in mind after X time to create your own subsidiary in taking different steps. And that's what we did. Uh, tell, in, tell me more yeah. about that. So creating your own subsidiary. Uh, talk to me yeah. about that. Yeah. Yeah, that, that is easy to talk about, very tough to do. <laughs> because obviously for the company, they're relatively new in the country. So at Hollister, the approach we took is uh, we formed a team uh, within the company. Uh, at that time, uh, when I was director of... Uh, uh, those geographies, uh, I was deeply involved, but so was uh, uh, um, somebody uh, like, uh, at that time, even the VP of international was personally involved, which was important. Um, and then for the different, uh, for the different functions, we had a team member uh, involved, uh, finance and uh, the, the logistics, uh, the legal aspects, uh, everybody had their job. So this was not a full-time job. We had their job and on top this job. And then basically we went and uh, worked with the different distributors to have an amicable parting of the ways um, because they benefited a lot and there was very good relationships. I mean, they didn't like it, but... Uh, when you have a distribution agreement, uh, it normally is for X number of years renewable, but there are minimal annual purchase quotas. So anyway, by doing this uh, in the country, we started uh, 
basically, like we did in McKinsey with a small team, you start uh, by hiring uh, a good general manager, a good VP of sales and marketing, and a good financial manager. And that's it. Hmm. Uh, and then you, you work, uh, in other words, there was a transition period with the distributor, which is good for everybody. And then uh, you create a strategy, uh, an action plan on how to get there. And uh, some of these distributors uh, turn out to be sub-distributors for parts of the business. So that, that's how we build the, the business. And rather than trying to do all kinds of country at once, this was like uh, in stages, okay? Yeah. Walk me through. So help educate me a bit on how this typically works. So take a you know, a medical device company that is not some global medical device company, but, you know, some mod- modest, moderate size, and they have a product that, you know, could work in other markets. They don't have the sales force to get into that market. Um, how does a typical arrangement work with a distributor? So just uh, maybe uh, yes. l- let's say that's a U.S.-based medical device company that's invented a device, they have their own sales force in the U.S., let's say, and they're selling it and they want to enter, I don't know, Germany or Australia. Uh, and right. So how, how would it work par- partnering with the distributor? What's the typical terms and how does it work? Okay, that's a very, very good question. Um, okay, the, yeah, the, the first uh, thing that uh, we work out is... Uh, understanding very well why our client in their market in the in, for let's say us why are they successful okay and what are the keys to that success and second what are the main issues and problems that they encounter not just now but also when they began and went through the different phases of growing to where they are so there's a lot of lessons learned and then it, to get the actually the owner or the president of the company uh, to firmly uh, back uh, this up so that we're not just dealing with the lower in the organization where they might not be uh, as enthusiastic as spending time on something that doesn't benefit them directly. Um, okay, so that's on, on this end. On the other end, uh, knowing the key factors for success, we develop uh, a criteria for what would make a good distributor, okay? And then we do a search of, of different companies within that country that fit that criteria, and they evaluate them. So let's say that we've done that, and we have uh, the top two. Uh, or let's say this one that uh, really stands out. Okay, so the, the way we work with them is uh, that... We explain to them the, the potential, uh, how well it has worked in other countries, okay? Uh, in the base country uh, and in other countries. And if it's the first country in international, just about the US. And uh, what the market potential could be in that country and what shares could be in a three to five year period. And then, uh, and then we help them. Uh, we ask them to please uh, do uh, what we call a mini regulatory plan in a mini marketing plan. The mini regulatory and then uh, uh, a mini legal plan. You know, I'll go into each one of these. The mini regulatory plan is, well, uh, you need approval from the regulatory authorities in that country in order to be able to, to sell. So therefore, there is a process and then they have to be good at it and uh, and know how to do this or work with consultants in that country that will get the job done well and quickly so so that's one key element Uh, the second one is a mini marketing plan which is well i know that you normally do things this way or that way but uh, we know uh, because we shared with you what works well for our client in this specific product and industry and by the way, they have to be exclusive for this part. We don't allow them to have a competitive product, okay? Uh, and then they uh, they themselves analyze the market and come up with a, a mini marketing plan. Normally, it's a give and take because the first version that comes uh, back is not 
particularly good. Sometimes we're surprised uh, because uh, they, they need to learn, for example. Is it uh, direct to consumer? Is that very important these days? And not just working with hospitals and professionals or a combination thereof. And what competition is there? And why are they successful or not successful? So anyway, we work together with them to create a, in a mini marketing plan. And then on the legal side, um, we give them an exclusivity. This is very key. They have to be exclusive uh, for three, a minimum of three years, uh, renewable. Uh, because if they're not exclusive, they're not going to invest and they're not going to give priority to your product. That's my experience out of 30 years in international. Uh, okay, now the other side of the coin is, well, how do we know that they talk a lot and they don't deliver? That's why the contract uh, has minimal annual purchase quotas, which are uh, not aggressive, but they are only a conservative percentage of what the market uh, analysis showed that is reasonable to achieve. So therefore, it's not something that you're trying to, uh, uh, that they're totally stressed or they'll never achieve it. It's something that if they're a good distributor, they will achieve. Therefore, they'll invest. And then uh, it can be, re uh, normally it renews. And so we have distributors uh, for different clients uh, that we've been working over a decade. So that, that's how we do it. And then after that, uh, we engage with them as group partners, uh, not just emails or once in a while in a phone call. Uh, we talk to them uh, in depth calls uh, at least once a month at the beginning every week and also emails uh, back and forth uh, so that they're on the right road and a lot of back and forth. We learn from them because if we chose them, they're good in their country, and we learn from them, and they learn from us. So every uh, distributor, including our clients, shares all their things with us. We then share it with the different groups, and everybody helps. So let me give you an example of one of our distributors had a terrific idea that our client, this client that I talked about, uh, said, wow, if it works for him, I wonder if this will work well in the U.S., so what it was is direct to consumer. So uh, this client said, I'm going to go to a direct response TV, even though it's expensive. Uh, I'm going to pilot this in a small city in my country and see if it works well. He did, and it worked extremely well. So then he said, ah, I'm going to do it in more small uh, cities. Worked extremely well. Well, then he went to regions. Then he went to national who then gave him the, the local rates because they wanted to be competitive of all the budget he was spending. So then our client in the U.S. said, well, my goodness, if that works in that country, why don't I pilot this here? He did. And today, uh, at least 40% at least, uh, of his sales come this way. Hmm. So uh, th th this is basically how we work. So it is a step by step, and that's why we have these long-term relationships with the clients and with the distributors. Doesn't mean that we don't take short-term projects. We do. Mm -hmm. but, now, uh, that's not the way we look at things. Now these distributors, you say they're exclusive, but they, I imagine, they typically are selling a variety of medical devices, just not something right in that same category. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly what you said. Exactly. Right, because they would have relationships with procurement officers at hospitals or at the government health care purchasing organization or however that market is structured. They exactly. Okay. It's exactly as you would describe it, yes. And if it's direct to consumer important in that market, they would have had some good experience in it and not be neophytes. Yeah. Now, if they're neophytes, they can hire good direct to consumer consultants, okay? And we've had some distributors that have done that. That said, look, the market is moving this way. I need to be good at this. And they hired some very good consultants, local ones, to help them do this. How do you identify the even the sort of selection set of distributors in a given market? Are there good 
databases where you can look up, you know, Germany or the Czech Republic or Australia and say, what are all the distributors, medical device distributors in that market? Or is it more just one by one, like research or knowing the industry? How do you even identify the set of uh, the consideration set of companies to think about talking to? Yeah, well, that's also, it's a very good question. This is it's a very tough part. Um, it's a combination of all the different things you mentioned. Uh, Sam is uh, you just basically uh, know already because of your contacts in that country. OK, uh, whether they are a candidate or they can uh, recommend to you somebody uh, that has that profile. So, for example, we just for one of our clients, uh, somebody that we had worked with uh, in Germany before, uh, I called him and I said, look, we're looking for somebody in Germany. Uh, and uh, so he found a German company that way uh, for us, for a client. And then another one that we had worked in Germany, we said, look, uh, do you by any chance know somebody that has this kind of profile in the Nordic countries? He said, "Well, <laughs> you're in luck. I do." And uh, so he gave me, uh, you know, that contact. And now we're about to sign him up for another client of ours. But uh, sometimes it's more difficult, so we need to do, you know, our own Google search. Many times that doesn't work, uh, and then uh, uh, we have to try and do some market research companies we haven't had good experience with them frankly the ones that do the reports mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because they talk a lot and they tell a lot but when you say okay it take one country of all the ones that you say you're so good and uh, answer at least one of these five questions with specifics and you know something for two of them we got zero back mm -hmm. uh, so Maybe some of the Ambrix uh, uh, individual consultants that have experience in that industry or in that country uh, could be helpful in that. So it's, it's what you said. It's a little bit of all of that. Uh, Fascinating. Uh, you said you had another uh, sanitized case example, this one where you went at risk on your fees. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, no, th this, is, this is a very interesting one. Uh, at the time we started with them, it was a small company. So it was out of the question that they would uh, pay for a fee. Uh, there was a small retainer for a couple of months while we learned about uh, their business. Um, and then it was success fee. So then uh, we basically tried to identify uh, which countries uh, Europe would be the, the, the ones, okay? If, if that's a specific country in that, that industry because uh, the healthcare systems are good and uh, it's not just price and it's the, the, the quality of life, environment, etc. Even though this product compared to the alternatives it produced uh, 60 to 70 percent savings compared to the, the the others but it was new it was a new so the real competition in that case was uh, you know the lack of knowledge you know the, the competition is uh, you know ignorance okay <laughs> patients consumers don't know that this better alternative exists so uh, we, we selected uh, a few countries in in, uh, in Europe uh, to target, and by the kind of process that you mentioned, um, we uh, we contacted different people. As one example, for that industry, uh, we went to the patient association in that country, hmm. also to the doctors and nurses association to see what companies. Uh, uh, advertised in their website uh, and magazine and then we wrote to each one of them uh, an email and one immediately called back and said i'm very interested so we called him uh, next day and when he heard uh, this uh, he was uh, we were very lucky they were totally dedicated to this industry that we're talking about this segment and 
so after he heard that, he said, you know something? God smiled at me when you called me today. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, within three weeks, we had a signed agreement with him, and he placed his first order, which was not a small one. And right now, he's a star distributor and performer. So that's one extreme, okay? Uh, and we've got others extreme where, where it's taken us uh, you know, more than a year to, or more to identify a good distributor. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and basically, the, the way we're compensated is uh, all the purchases that these international distributors make from our client, we get a percentage from that. Uh, a next percentage. Yeah, so that aligns your incentives with with your uh, with your client. Yes, and he, he's a very good CEO and owner because when there's a bid, a big bid, and he has to lower his prices. Uh, he's willing to lower the prices, and in those cases, we participate with him. If he did, for example, reduce his prices by twenty percent to win a big bid, we reduce our commission by twenty percent. Mm -hmm. In that way, everybody's aligned. Yeah. Tom, if folks want to find out more about your firm or reach out to you, where would you point them online? Thank you for asking. Um, okay. One way would be to send me an email, and it is tom, T-O-M, at Brewer Partners. That's B-R-E-U-E-R -E -E Partners with anisadm.com all together. Another way would be uh, our website, which is www.brewerpartners.com. And the third way would be plus one, myself, 847-624-1011. And the other way is to reach uh, via Ambrex and Will. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Well, we'll include that info in the show notes. Tom, it has been great speaking with you today. Amazing what you have done in your career and so exciting that you're um, you know, still building your firm. Uh, thanks so much for joining. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. And it's a privilege to work with you, uh, Will, and with Ambrex.